All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started for announcements. Um, so we will be doing lab three this Friday. And I think we've solved the uh, thin wire, breadboard, high current, high voltage drop problem. So uh, uh, Laura, uh, Lauren in the ITLL Electronic Center um, is fabricating some circuit boards for us so we can make these little motor driver boards. I've tested it out. It works great. So we'll be doing that this, this Friday in lab and then integrating that with lab three. So for lab three, you will be programming the Arduino board. And the ITLL has the Arduino IDE, the Integrated Development Environment. That's the software you use to program the Arduino. The ITLL has that installed on their computers, but it's an older version. And many people like the older version because it's, it's more stable. I've had a couple issues with the new version, but I like the new version better and I actually recommend it because even though every once in a while you have to unplug your board and plug it back in and restart the software, um, it has some better plotting capabilities. I think it has a better serial monitor. I like the interface. I think it's easier to use, but that's not on the ITLL computer. So what I recommend um, from, from now, I think the best option from now through the end of the lab while you're programming the Arduino is to actually bring a laptop. So you, you know, you, you and your lab partner, one of you or both of you bring a laptop with the Arduino IDE installed with the, the latest version. Um, you can go to, you could just, you know, type Arduino software into the, the interwebs and uh, you will, uh, you'll see how to download and install that. If, if you don't do that before lab, I can show you how to do that in lab this Friday. You don't have to do that. If you don't have a laptop, if you don't want to do that, you can always use the older version of the IDE on the ITLL uh, computers. But if you have it on your laptop, then for this work that you're going to be doing, you don't necessarily need to be in the ITLL when you're working on your project, unless you need the test equipment, right? During, during lab, of course, you need to be there, but if you're doing work outside of lab, you don't need to be in the ITLL if you have the software installed on your laptop. So that's what I recommend. Um, and I use the new version myself. On the schedule next week, we have an exam coming up. It is, I'll say a take-home exam. I will be sending details out about that um, I think it shows it's due Friday. I, I will send details about that and, and what that's going to cover, but there shouldn't be any time pressure on that because, well, it's what I call take home. So I will, um, I'll send information about how to download that, how long you have, how to submit that to Canvas, and that will be coming out this week. And if you have any questions about that, stop by office hours and we will chat. Okay. So let's continue on with the lecture material. So we were talking about oscilloscopes during the last class. This is where we wound up. We talked about probes and I mentioned how it's common to use 10X probes. 10X probes um, load the circuit down less. In other words, they look like a, a, a much higher impedance than let's say just connecting a BNC cable with alligator clips on the end to the circuit, which could affect your measurements. So I always recommend using 10X probes, the probes designed for the oscilloscope, and make sure that you have the 10X attenuation set in the settings for the channel. And, uh, and don't use the probes as connections between, let's say, a, a device like a, a, a function generator or, or a waveform generator to output a signal to your board because it, it won't work through the 10X probe. Okay. Um, I point out here that, you know, I, I call the, the center conductor of the probe, the probe tip, and that's the usually considered the positive side. The negative clip on lead here, I'm calling ground and I'm calling it ground um, for a reason, I'm going to tell you about what I call the ground loop trap, right? So this is a way you can get yourself in trouble with measurements when you're using an oscilloscope. Let's suppose you have a motor and a MOSFET just like you have in lab and you're connecting 
in this case, five volts um, supply, and then you have ground down here. So when you make the MOSFET conduct or act like a closed switch, current flows down to ground. And so that's essentially what you have in lab. We're going to be talking about MOSFETs later in the course, but know now that the MOSFET looks like, in this case, a switch, an electronically controlled switch that either conducts or is open. Okay, so current flows through the motor down through the MOSFET to ground, and you can control that with this wire that we were control calling the control voltage. Um, let's suppose you want to measure this MOSFET voltage, right? I call it VFET of T. It's a time domain voltage. So let's use an oscilloscope to measure that voltage. Okay, I'm explicitly calling out this ground here connected to the the ground lead of the probe, because I want to point out and emphasize, remember when I talked about power supplies, I said that green, that green connector, that green terminal is actually connected to earth ground, the AC power system ground, the, the that third prong on the plug that goes into the wall outlet. Okay, so is this power supplies outer conductor of the, uh, of the BNC connector. And that outer conductor, that shield of the BNC connector through the cable is actually connected to this ground lead here. Okay, so that means that if your circuit is is connected to ground, right? Let's suppose you're, you have a function generator powering this or some other equipment connected to your circuit's ground. Then your circuit's ground is also connected to earth ground or AC ground, the third prong on the outlet. So that means these two are connected together, right? From what well, you intended the connection right there because you connected it, but also there's another connection there that is through the ground, through the equipment, but that's okay because in this case, measuring VFET, um, you're, you're actually um, referencing both voltages to ground. VFET is referenced to, gr to earth ground and so is the negative lead of the power supply, uh, sorry, the oscilloscope probe. Okay, all right, Let, so that works. Let me show you what doesn't work. And this is the trap. Here's, here's the same circuit. And let's suppose you want to measure the motor voltage, right? Your, your pulse width modulating the voltage and you say, and look on the left here and you say, well, I'm measuring the FET voltage, but I really want the motor voltage. So why don't I measure the motor voltage? And let's say that you know, this control line is pulsing Right, like is shown on the on the screen on the oscilloscope, and that's what you see across the MOSFETs uh, terminals here. But you really want V motor, so you connect the oscilloscope like this. And so this is not good because what you've done is here you have a ground connection. The shield of that BNC connector is a ground connection, and that means that this negative lead here is a ground connection. And we often call that um, a ground loop. Okay, so 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 don't do this. the The bad thing I'm pointing out here is connecting the ground lead of an oscilloscope probe to any node in your circuit that isn't truly ground. Okay. In fact, you should connect it to ground. That will give you the best connection. Even though even though you might see a signal when you don't have this ground lead connected to your circuit's ground because you have that path through, well, the AC power line to the other equipment, right, to your circuit. Um, that's a very long path and that could have high inductance or high resistance. So you, you generally do want to connect this, this lead to ground. Uh, the, the power supplies, oh, not the power supply, the oscilloscopes ground lead for the probe to, to the ground of your circuit. So you wanna do that. But in this case, what's going to happen is let's suppose this MOSFET is, is off. The current's trying to flow from five volts to ground. So it's flowing here through the motor and then back through your oscilloscope, back to you know, the, the third lead on your, um, on your wall plug, back to whatever equipment's actually connected to ground. And so that's called a ground loop. Ground loop is loosely defined. There are other other definitions of ground loop, this is one of those definitions. But the, but the takeaway here is be careful where you connect the negative lead, this clip, 
of an oscilloscope probe because you could unintentionally short a node to ground. Okay, so that's that's important. If you actually did want to measure the motor voltage and not the the FET voltage, the MOSFET voltage here, you could actually use two channels. You take two channels of the oscilloscope and you connect both grounds to the ground of your circuit um, and you measure you put one of the, the tips here to measure that VFET voltage, and you could put uh, the other tip up here at five volts, even though it's constant, and you could do a subtract function. The oscilloscopes will actually subtract channel two from channel one or channel one from channel two. And so you're doing a subtraction to see you're synthetically creating um, a measurement on the screen that is V motor here, okay? So that's that's something to consider. That's the trap that people can fall into. Um, so generally, use an oscilloscope to measure node voltages um, with the ground probe, with the ground of the probe connected to circuit ground, and you'll be good. All right. Any questions on that? Oh, would you? If you did need to measure the voltage across the motor, would you just uh, kind of connect it like how you have it in the first one? Yeah, well, I, what I would do is I would um, I would connect it like I have on the left on one channel, and then with a second channel. Well, well, first of all, you could just say the motor voltage is five minus VFET, so you could collect VFET and in MATLAB or Excel say your motor voltage is five minus VFET. But if you think that five volts is varying or isn't exactly five, what I would do is I would connect a second probe between ground and five, and then I would do what I described that subtract function. So if channel one is VFET and channel two is VS, then I would set, like, I would set up a, a trace on the oscilloscope that is um, you know, V2 minus V1. And that would, that would show you on the screen the subtraction of those two voltages, which would give you the motor voltage. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So with oscilloscopes, let's finish off with, with saving screen captures, data, and configuration. Most modern oscilloscopes do this. In lab, you will be required to take screen captures. And so, there are um, some common save and, and recall functions on many scopes and the scope you have in, in lab. So screen captures are for recording um, views of basic measurements and waveform features. So you go in, you hit the save recall button, you go to format um, on the, the soft keys down here, and you'll see you know, bitmaps. So you put a USB stick into the USB port of the scope and um, you can record a color bitmap. Okay, so that'll be saved to your USB stick or other formats. Okay, so you can also save data files. So let's suppose you're going to do something with this data. You're going to process the capture of that time domain waveform over a certain period. Because you could take really long captures with oscilloscopes wider than what the screen is is showing. You can capture on many oscilloscopes millions of samples instead of just what's shown on the screen. And so to save that um, that data, you would select one of these formats for saving. CSV is comma separated values, right? You can load CSV files into Excel. It just loads them even without importing. Um, ASCII XY data, Looks like it gives you um, time and voltage data in in ASCII. Hmm. It's probably just a dim different format, but it's still. Uh, uh, I'd have to. We'd have to download a, a file and see why those are different. I don't know why they would be different. Or binary data. So binary data, you usually get either eight bit or sixteen bit binary files that you cannot usually load into Excel, but you could load it into MATLAB or Python, and then create plots or do some signal processing on the, the waveform you've collected. So that's, that's usually useful. Um, and then there are um, 
settings for later uh, recall of scope settings. So it, if you if you took the time to set your scope up so it has a certain trigger and a certain vertical span, horizontal span um, scale, and you know measurement functions, and you know get that all set up for your your measurement. You could save the settings of the scope to a USB stick, and then later you don't have to go through all the button pushes. So that's really useful, especially when you're doing a demonstration that requires the scope to be set just right, and you have a customer show up, and you don't want to be fiddling with buttons. So you load up the waveform or load up the settings that you know work, and do your demo. All right. So other features, um, oscilloscopes typically have cursors and built-in automated measurements. So um, cursors here, right, with this button on your scope in lab, support determining characteristics of the waveform that's displayed on the screen. So here are two horizontal or voltage, right? cursors set up so you uh, you can adjust these so I can turn a knob and I can make this orange line go up and down or I can make this other orange line go up and down and usually there's some kind of display on the screen that shows you in this case the voltage corresponding to each of those dotted orange lines those cursors and then usually a delta right this is delta y the difference between those two that's that's pretty useful um, for making absolute and, and relative voltage measurements. And you can use uh, vertical cursors for time measurements. They're also useful when, when you're adjusting something in your circuit and you're looking at the screen and you want to make sure that the sine wave amplitude doesn't change. So you set those up as reference lines. And that way you can see, okay, the peak and the trough touch these cursors. And if you do something and look back at the scope, and they're off a little bit, it'll be pretty obvious that they're not touching the lines anymore, touching the cursors, okay? So there are also measurement functions. So this button here on your scope performs um, measurements. It calculates characteristics from the waveform displayed on the screen. So these, these measurements typically include uh, frequency and period. So you can you can set up uh, let's see is it set up over here it's not shown here but but you can make a field on the screen display the frequency of the waveform right you can measure mean voltage peak to peak voltage and RMS and have that display in a field on the screen minimum and maximum of the waveform you're measuring. Um, rise and fall times, if you care about how fast the transition is between low to high of a, of a digital signal. Um, pulse widths, if you're, if you're capturing um, pulse widths and uh, phase and delay. And also when you're measuring in lab, let's see, lab three this Friday, you might want to set up a measurement to show you frequency and duty cycle. That way you can confirm that your microcontroller is outputting the pulse width modulation duty cycle that you expect. You just set up a field on the screen and it'll show you the duty cycle. And when you're outputting your, you're measuring your voltage from the microcontroller, you just glance over at the, at the field for your measurement and it'll show you the duty cycle. So that's convenient. Okay. Okay, the default and the auto buttons. These are useful and dangerous all, all at once. So uh, these are the two buttons here. And so here's what I recommend, and I do it every time I show up at a scope, a public scope in the lab, or even my own scope here that I haven't used in a while, You know, if, if I haven't used it in a few days. So whenever you show up at the bench and you're, you're going to make a measurement with an oscilloscope, I recommend you turn on the scope, and the first thing you do is you press the default setup. Some scopes call this the factory setting or the, uh, you know, there's different names for it, but it's basically, it's like you just bought the scope, plugged it in, turned it on for the first time, and it's a known state, okay? And so this is great for, 
for when other people before you have used the scope and they've put the scope into some kind of configuration, they've changed 22 different settings, you show up and you don't know which of the 22 different settings to set back. So, so you don't have some weird trigger filtering or low bandwidth on your channel measurement or, you know, something weird. They, they might've done something. If you come in and the first thing you do is you hit default setup on the scope and lab after you turn it on, you're starting at the known state every time you use the scope in lab. So I recommend doing that. Okay, then there's this auto scale button. And this is the temptation of everybody to use. Just connect your probes, hit auto scale, and you know the auto driving car will get me there. Um, I generally do not use auto scale because, I mean, I, I like 1% of the time I'll use it because I, I generally know what I'm looking for. And so I, I kind of know that if I turn the vertical and horizontal settings while I'm measuring that um, I, I'm going to get the scope in a, in a, on a scale that I know uh, that I want. But if you do use it, and when I do use it, um, verify that the scales, horizontal and vertical axis scales are, are reasonable. Because sometimes you hit auto scale and either your probe's not connected to the signal you think it is, or it's not connected, or there's noise on that signal. And your scope thinks you want to look not at the close to DC signal, but the noise on that signal, right? And so it zooms in on noise. So this is an example of a measurement I was making and it shows that, so I, I just hit, I just hit auto scale and auto scale chose to zoom in on the noise. You could see this is only 20 millivolts per division. So this is a pretty low level. Um, and I think this was a I think this was a bad probe connection. The probe wasn't connected or was connected through a wire that wasn't wasn't really connected well to the to the circuit. So again, if you said, you know, oh, that's the circuit I actually have, well, it's not what you're looking for. So you know, check your vertical scale, horizontal scale, make sure that your scales are showing you what you what you want. All right. Okay. So let's go from the measurement of AC waveforms to the generation of AC waveforms using a, uh, a function or uh, also called a waveform generator. So I call it a function generator. Sometime in the last 10 years, People started calling them waveform generators. They're the same thing. Um, function generators, waveform generators create AC voltage waveforms. And so common waveforms are uh, sinusoids, square waves or rectangular waves, um, ramp waveforms or triangular waveforms, um, pulses, maybe a pulse that happens every, you know, maybe a microsecond pulse that happens every 10 milliseconds, something like that. You can create random noise or pseudo random noise actually. Um, and you can also create arbitrary waveforms. So you can take a, you can take Excel or MATLAB, you can export a file, save a file and um, define amplitudes, right? A time domain waveform that will play over and over again in a loop that comes out of this signal generator, function generator. Um, that's, that's really useful if you wanted to, let's say, you know, uh, test your, let's say your, your circuit receives some kind of digital waveform and you don't, you don't have the transmitter, right? You have the receiver. And so, uh, you know, digital baseband, you could actually create a series of bits um, in a file, create those amplitudes and then output that from the, the function generator and actually trigger it and test your circuit. So applications are um, amplifier and filter testing. So let's suppose you're building maybe an audio amplifier that has a certain frequency response, right? Um, you, could, you could sweep the, the filter by changing frequencies of the waveform generator. You can use this waveform generator as a pulse width modulation source, which is what you're going to be doing um, in lab this Friday. You could use it as a, a timing signal source. 
Okay, so that's this is what you're going to do. You're going to control motor speed using the duty cycle setting of this uh, um, waveform generator's PWM output signal. So you're just going to create a square wave, adjust the duty cycle, control your motor speed with the duty cycle to test it. Um, you could periodically trigger interrupts of a microcontroller to test an RPM sensor. We'll get to talking about microcontrollers, but um, every time your propeller blade goes in front of the infrared sensor, right? There's going to be a, a, a pulse out of the sensor's output, right? When the when the blade crosses, the pulse I think is going to go low, and when the blade gets out of the way, the pulse goes back high. So if you want to trigger a timer so you could time blade crossings um, and you want to test that without actually having the motor there and actually test it with a known frequency, you can set up the waveform generator to simulate, to emulate the output of that infrared sensor. And so you could say, oh, this is 90 hertz and that converts to so many blades per second and RPM. And you can look on the Arduino's output and say, okay, it's working or no, it's three times as fast or no, it's half as, half as, you know, half of what it should be for an RPM output. That's what a waveform generator is really good for. This is the um, voltage waveform output here. It's a BNC output. Um, here's where you select the main parameters. Um, you can say waveforms, parameters, units, other options here. And then you have sub menus for setting uh, the settings <clears throat> and waveform parameter control down here. Okay, so setting the waveform. So you select, this is how you create a waveform with the function generator you have in lab. Okay, oh wait, let me go back. Someone said, what's the sync pin for? Okay, so the sync pin is, let's suppose you have, um, you could use it for a few things, but let's suppose you have a, a waveform you want to output and you want to trigger it. So maybe I'm outputting some kind of, you know, I'm I'm creating I'm creating a, a radar waveform for like a you know a, a radar gun to detect vehicle speed or something like that. Um, and I want to trigger that waveform at a certain time from some external source. You can use you can use this sync as an input to trigger your arbitrary waveform to come out or trigger a pulse, things like that, or start the start the output. So that lets you synchronize this device, this instrument with other circuits. Okay. So to create a waveform, you select the waveform type. In this case, I've selected a, a sine wave. And so this is again the waveform generator you have in lab. And then you could set the parameters for that sine wave. Okay, so here I've selected sine on the left and on the right after I've pressed parameters, go down to these keys um, and adjust frequency, amplitude. You can have a DC offset and you can adjust a phase um, relative to, um, and that I, I would bet that that sync input, I'm not sure if this function generator does it, but oftentimes you can have an input of another signal and adjust the phase of the output with respect to that other signal. I don't know if this waveform generator does that. So someone asked, is, is PWM a square wave? Yes, pulse width modulation will be a square wave. Yep. Okay. So uh, the waveform on the screen is not an actual measurement of the waveform being created. So you see the sine wave and if I do something if I connect this to a circuit that is going to maybe distort or 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 change this waveform in some way, maybe it's a nonlinear circuit and it's loading it down or something. Just rem just remember that you know just because you see a sine wave on this cartoon screen here, it doesn't mean that's the sine wave you actually have at the end of the terminals of the cable coming out of this. Okay, that's just, just a cartoon to show you, hey, you have the sine wave setting set, right? So don't count on that. If you really want to know what is at the other end of your, your test leads, uh, take an oscilloscope and measure at the other end of the test leads.
So you're going to create offset square waves for pulse width modulation in lab this, um, this Friday. So function generators can create in general waveforms for digital circuits and digital circuit synchronization or, or clocks. Um, and they can create signals for pulse width modulation. So if I have a digital circuit, a counter and I want to test it and I want to clock it every, you know, second, half second, I can create a square wave with a certain frequency and I can create um, a voltage that transitions, varies between low and high. Okay, I'll show you an example. So the square waves that you use for digital logic signals usually vary between zero volts and some other voltage, right? There are, there are different specifications. What you will see commonly, common electronics is um, digital logic levels will, for example, for the Arduino you're using uh, on the header pins, you'll see the voltages will vary between transition between zero volts and five volts, okay? Um, some digital circuits use 3.3 volts as a high. Some low power digital circuits use one volt, so. But the point is, we're dealing with square waves here. And then DC offsets are typically used to create the digital or pulse width modulation square wave. Okay, so here's how to do that. So here I have, um, for example, a five volt peak to peak set on, this, on the function generator and zero volt offset. And that's gonna look like this. And this is not what I want for the digital signal um, because Here's the oscilloscope screen. This is zero volts right here, right? And I'm actually varying between minus 2.5 volts and plus 2.5 volts. And that's what I've asked the function generator, generator to do, right? Amplitude, five volts peak to peak, that is that. Offset of zero, that's that, right? So um, what I really want to do, and you'll do this this Friday, is I want to create a signal that transitions between zero volts and five volts. So you do that like this, you set an amplitude of five volts, an offset of 2.5, and you'll get this. So here is zero volts, right? Um, here is five volts, and here is that 2.5 volt offset. So when you're, so this Friday and in the future, when you want to create a pulse width modulated signal, this is typical of PWM um, or a digital clock, be sure you have that offset in there. That offset keeps the voltage from going negative and it brings the positive voltage up to a high enough voltage that is the high logic level, All right? Any questions on that, how, how I created that waveform because you'll have to do it this Friday. I'll be there, but. Okay, are offsets positive usually? Not necessarily. Um, offsets, offsets can be anything you want and they can actually not return to zero and they can be negative. There are some logic circuits that use um, negative voltages. And in fact, when we get to um, MOSFETs, there are MOSFETs called depletion mode MOSFETs where you have to, where if you apply zero volts to the gate, the MOSFET's on. And if you want to turn the MOSFET off, you have to apply negative voltage. So if you wanted to pulse width modulate that MOSFET, you'd alternate between zero and like negative something, zero and negative something. So there, there are uses for um, negative offsets and negative logic levels. Yeah, and it, yeah, it depends, depends on the logic. So creating um, a PWM voltage waveform is, is common. That's a common use of a function generator. You can define a, a duty cycle, right? And so in this case, here's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm setting, as I showed you on the last slide, an amplitude of five volts peak to peak and an offset of 2.5 volts. 
And then here I've got, I have a duty cycle of 20% set. Okay, so you set the duty cycle to control the percentage of time that the waveform will be high compared to the period of, of the square wave. And essentially what this does is it controls, it controls the average voltage, right? Um, applied. So here is a five volt peak to peak waveforms, right? So here's voltage on the left, here's time, here's zero volts right here, here's five volts. And so this is 5%, um, no, five volts peak to peak, pulse width modulation with a 20% duty cycle, okay? So this shows that the period here is 500 microseconds. So you can probably barely read these numbers down here. This is where my mouse is, that's zero seconds. This is minus 400 microseconds, here's minus 800. So it looks like I'm at 200 microseconds per division setting here. Um, and let's see, and then so, I'm high, it looks like, about half of a division. So half of a division would be what? Uh, one, uh, 400, 600, 100 microseconds. So, so 100 microseconds high divided by 500 microseconds period is a 20% duty cycle. All right. So that's how, that's how to set that up. Um, if I want a higher average voltage or for some reason, right, I'm, I want the pulses to be high 80% of the time, just change the duty cycle. And so here is a pulse width modulated output square wave that is 80%. So I still have the same period. So frequency is one over period. I have the same frequency, same period, 500 microseconds. But in this case, the signal is high 80% of the time, or it looks like 400 microseconds. Okay. All right, so this is what you're going to do this week in lab. On the top, that would be turning your motor very slowly. On the bottom, that would be turning your motor fast. And you're not going to change frequency. You're not going to change amplitude. You're just going to change the duty cycle to pulse the control signal into your MOSFET um, to control motor speed. All right. Any questions on this, how to generate that signal? All right. Okay, let me show you the, uh, I like to talk about these traps, right? the traps of test equipment. You can get yourself into a trap. This is called, this is what I call the output impedance trap of a function generator. So you may have run into this before in circuits class, but it's worth understanding why this happens. So let's suppose I have a, a, the waveform generator set to create a two volt peak to peak waveform. Okay, so two volts, it's set. Um, and you notice up here, I have the output impedance set to 50 ohms. So I mentioned, we often call a Thevenin impedance, actually in, in the real world, I don't know that we ever use the term Thevenin impedance, we call it output impedance. So we have the output impedance set to 50 ohms, 50 ohms real for this function generator, okay. So what that means is, is this. In the blue box here, I have the Thevenin equivalent of the function generator. Here's, here's the sine wave generator here that has some amplitude, some frequency. And the function generator actually has a 50 ohm output impedance, which is a 50 ohm Thevenin impedance. And so when you have the... Um, when you have the, the function generator connected to a 50 ohm load and 
the 50 ohm output impedance set in the generator, you will see this. You, will, you would expect this. I have two volts peak to peak set. I measure across that load with an oscilloscope. I see two volts peak to peak. You know, big deal. It's what it's what I expect. I expect two volts peak to peak, and that's true. Here's where the trap is: is understanding this. In order for the function generator to create two volts peak to peak here across the load internally. It would have to create, if it used this model, four volts peak to peak, right? Because that four volts is divided, voltage divider, between 250 ohm resistors to get two volts here. <clears throat> okay. So then you come along, maybe, and you show up at the function generator, and it's set to 50 ohms. And you turn it on, you set two volts peak to peak, and you don't connect a 50 ohm load. You just connect it to an oscilloscope, which is a high impedance load, right? There's there's nothing nothing connected here. It's an open. So then, what you will see on the oscilloscope is four volts peak to peak at the output, right? That's because there's no current going through that 50 ohm resistor, so there's no voltage drop across that 50 ohm resistor. And this is a real measurement, right? I, I did this in lab. You will see four volts peak to peak. So this is why, if if you think that the um, function generator is giving you twice the voltage, I bet you have the output impedance set wrong. So if the function generator is set to 50 ohms, the output voltage will be twice what you expect when connected to a high impedance, as is shown here. And that's why. So you've got to, you know, when you first turn on a function generator, make sure if you're working with a 50 ohm system, set it or leave it on 50 ohms. If you're working with a a high impedance system like the input to a FET, a digital system, big resistance values like 1K or bigger, um, then you should set this on high impedance, which I'll show you next. Okay, so now if I, if I set two volts peak to peak, I set the function generator on high Z, high impedance, Z is impedance. Um, I, st I still have a 50 ohm output impedance of the function generator. Inside, it still looks like the function generator is, is modeled by a voltage source with 50 ohms. But if I don't connect anything to the terminals, in other words, I apply a high impedance, infinity, infinite impedance, then I will have two volts peak to peak. And internally, it didn't change its impedance. All it did is halved divided by two, um, it's voltage source here. Okay, so I get two volts peak to peak. Now, if I, I leave the function generator on high impedance, okay, and then I connect a 50 ohm load, I'm actually only going to see one volt peak to peak, okay, because of that voltage division between 50 and 50. Okay, so if the function generator is set to high Z, the output voltage will be half of what you expect when connected to a 50 ohm load. Okay, so um, in general, when you're connecting to a piece of equipment, especially if it has a coax connector like a BNC connector or an SMA connector, it's important to pay attention to the output impedance and the input impedance to know whether it's high Z, high impedance, or 50 ohms. The oscilloscope is a weird exception. And I think that's just because you usually connect probes and not directly to a coax cable. But um, even though oscilloscopes have BNC connectors, many are not 50 ohms, they're, they're high impedance. Some high frequency scopes are 50 ohms. Um, let's see. And if you're working with anything that's high frequency, high frequency equipment, like a signal generator or a spectrum analyzer, um, or a power meter that has BNC or SMA connectors, expect those to be 50 ohms if they're high frequency. Okay. And then, and then remember this, if you're getting half or double of the voltage, um, or in terms of power, that would be, if I do my math right, four times or a quarter of the power, 
then you probably have some impedance mismatch in the system. Okay. Okay, and I say, uh, someone asked, when I say input impedance, is that the same as the load resistance? Yes, if you, for example, <clears throat> so imp uh, resistance is a special case of impedance. If impedance is totally real and has no imaginary component, meaning no capacitance, no inductance, if impedance is totally real, then impedance equals resistance. Um, when I say input impedance, that usually means a signal is going into something, right? Into a device like a power meter, like a spectrum analyzer, right? Something like that. And the spectrum analyzer or power meter is acting like a load. It's, it's, it's measuring, but it's taking in the power and it has a 50 ohm input impedance or a 50 ohm load resistance, okay? But that's, that's something to pay attention to when you're using test equipment in, in any lab, if it's, if it's an electronic, a piece of electronic test equipment. Okay, so general guidance for test and measurement. For, for measurement functions and test equipment that we did not cover or for different explanations, I, I throw this out there. Um, even if I didn't explain something on an oscilloscope, like how to do the FFTs or how to use hold off or you know some different functions. There's so much. There's so many resources. Once you have some of the basics and understand kind of what's going on, then go check YouTube. Go check the web. Um, uh, I even do that sometimes when I find some function on a scope that I haven't used before and I'm curious about. So lots of resources out there. Um, you know, or if you want to know what does a network analyzer do, I'd be happy to explain any of these at office hours or in lab. You know, what's a network analyzer do? What is S21? What is S12? What is what's a spectrum analyzer measuring in dBm per hertz? Right? What is that? You can you can find a lot of good resources out there, especially on YouTube to get simple explanations. Um, as I mentioned. Do the factory recall or the default settings when you start up an instrument if it has it, right? Um, if the equipment is not showing you the measurements you are expecting, right? I mentioned this in lab. I like to say it's one of one or more of three things. Uh, the circuit's either designed wrong, the circuit's either built wrong, or we're testing it wrong, right? So it's probably one of those. I usually go to those three things before I say, we have a bad component, unless I have some reason to think I applied some big voltage across a component or negative polarity. Um, so it's usually a, a design or construction problem with the circuit under test. So we have lots of wires, lots of opportunities for connections to come loose, especially when we use breadboards, or we have the incorrect equipment settings. So that's where I say, beware of auto scale and start you know, turning the scale knobs to see if you can find your, your voltage or turn the trigger level. So you can see, you can make sure that the trigger level is somewhere within the range of your input voltage or improper connections to the circuit for the measurements being made. So something common is you don't have common grounds for all of your test equipment. So your, your function generator and your oscilloscope Right, and if you're measuring node voltages, your your voltmeter should all have um, common grounds connected to your circuit. Okay, and so that would be this case, right? All of those ground symbols are all connected together. They should be connected to one node. If they're if in your circuit they're not connected to one node, I would put that under the built wrong category. If you're stimulating the circuit with a function generator, and its ground is not connected to circuit ground, I would consider that a tested wrong case. I mentioned, again, in summary, check blown fuses for when your ammeter is not reading a value that you expect. Um, check for ground loops. We talked about ground loops, especially when using the oscilloscope and using the function generator, because those outer conductors of the coax that connects to those ports, those are usually AC ground, earth ground, okay? And, you know, as I mentioned in lab last week, use a methodical approach, um, patience is key. And I like to say, many people like to say, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. So 
take it slow so you can get things done fast. Okay. All right, so it looks like I'm hitting the wall on time here. I don't want to go over and make folks miss appointments. So um, check Canvas for the upcoming due dates and due times. Pay attention to those times too, please. Homework three is due next Wednesday. And so we've covered enough material to do that homework now. Um, your exam is coming up next week. I will send out an announcement about that. It will be, again, a take home exam. Um, I will hold office hours right after class. So if you'd like to stick around, please stick around. We will chat. Um, if not, I will see you in lab this Friday or at the next lecture. And so have a great night.